Well, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for the second of two webinars we're doing around the topic of child detention. I'm going to apologize up front. About 20 minutes ago, they started doing construction on the apartment next door. Nothing I can do about it. Hopefully they stop soon. My name is Sarah Sturm and I'm on the Telos team based in Washington, DC. For those of you who are joining us at a Telos event for the first time, we're an American nonprofit based in DC and our mission is to form communities of peacemakers across lines of difference and equip them to help reconcile seemingly intractable conflict at home and abroad. Our topic today for a second week continues to be child detention. And we're gonna be building on the conversation we had last week with Priscilla that introduced us to this topic. If you weren't able to join us for that conversation, the recording's on YouTube, so you can go back and catch up after today if you're interested. Today, we're really fortunate to be joined by Shana Lowe and Jennifer Bing. Shana Lowe serves as an advocacy officer at Defense for Children International Palestine. Her experience with organizations in both the US and Palestine Israel has included fundraising, working with children, guest lecturing at high schools and colleges, organizing and leading coast-to-coast -coast advocacy tours, and bringing delegations to the region. Her legal research has covered topics ranging from forcible transfer, the international community's obligations under international humanitarian and human rights law, and the rights of prisoners and children. Shana holds a BA in political science from Columbia University and a JD from the City University of New York Law School. Jennifer Bing, our other guest, has worked at American Friends Service Committee since 1989, serving in various capacities in its Israel-Palestine programs. She directs the AFSC Palestine Activism Program in Chicago and works with her colleagues in Palestine and Israel. Jennifer's organized hundreds of speaking tours, conferences, workshops, advocacy campaigns, and educational programs about the Middle East in her tenure with AFSC. Before I hand it over to the two of them to really dive into this issue, I want to offer just a couple of framing thoughts from Telos based on our principles and practices of peacemaking. The first is centering the leadership of the marginalized. Being near or proximate to the most vulnerable and listening to community-based leaders are essential foundations for effective ethical movements, and those who pay the greatest price of unjust systems have unique perspectives on how to transform them. Shanna and Jennifer work with these people and these groups and these children and are here to help us understand more of that perspective. The other is the idea of owning our agency and responsibility and self-interrogating and advocating. We'll touch on this again a little bit more later, but in a nutshell, we wanna own the duty and opportunity to leave the world better than we entered it. And as we continue to learn and do the internal work of peacemaking, where we have access, we also amplify the voices of others and raise our own externally. We do this to expose and challenge external systemic injustice alongside internal bias by mobilizing and advocating to ensure that our shared resources are used in ways that diminish conflict and promote just peace. So Shana and Jennifer, welcome. Shana, I'd start with turning to you. Can you give us a little bit of the history of Defense for Children International Palestine and why the focusing on child detention is such an important issue you all work with? Great, thank you so much, Sarah, for that introduction. And thank you all for joining. Um, I recognize some names and faces on this call, so it's nice to see you um, joining us in, in here today. Um, and also Jennifer and I have cr created a handful of slides that we wanted to share just some visuals. So um, David, if it's possible to start um, projecting them, that would be great. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, I work for Defense for Children International Palestine. It's a um, local Palestinian run uh, human rights organization, the only human rights organization in the occupied Palestinian territory that's devoted exclusively to promoting and protecting Palestinian children's rights. Um, we have been around for about 30 years. This is our 30th anniversary year. Um, and we really started out basically as a, as a legal aid society. We can move on to the next slide. Um, and we were providing um, legal support and legal assistance to Palestinian children um, arrested and detained and prosecuted in the Israeli military court system. What we realized 
uh, in representing these children who are prosecuted for things like stone throwing, um, membership in a in a um, banned organization, um, and and other other crimes, um, according to the the uh, Israeli military law, is that the stories that we were hearing from children about the ill treatment, um, the chronic rights violations, they weren't just one-off cases. They were, they were, um, there was a, there was a pattern and we can move to the next slide. The, 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 um, the violations that we were seeing were, were widespread, systematic and institutionalized. And so it wasn't just about a bad apple in the army mistreating a Palestinian child. It was that we were realizing that the experiences that these children were having um, were intentional. It was the system working the way it was supposed to. And so we realized that we couldn't just be um, addressing these cases as, as one off representing these, these children, but that we really needed to expand our work, both in terms of the documentation. So recognizing that um, and, and identifying these patterns of ill treatment and, and other rights violations, and also expanding beyond just the advocacy in the, in the military courts, but, um, but expanding to advocacy beyond that, whether it was um, engaging at a local level or, or as we've really refocused in, in more recent years to, to advocating on a global level, both um, working in the United States and other countries and also at the international level with, with UN systems and, and bodies there. Um, let me just back up a minute. Um, I know many of you were on on the call that uh, that Priscilla, our former colleague at DCIP, um, was on last week. Um, but I just want to back up and give a little bit of context for what this military court system is, um, because it's not a typical justice system. I wouldn't even call it a justice system because it in no way is interested in justice. So first of all, since Israel occupied the West Bank in 1967, there have been two legal systems at work in the same territory. Israeli civilian settlers who live in the occupied Palestinian territory in the West Bank um, are prosecuted in, in and fall under the jurisdiction of the Israeli civilian uh, court system. For Palestinians living in the same territory, sometimes only hundreds of meters away, um, they are prosecuted in the military court system. Military courts are, are never meant to be used to prosecute civilians and they should be, and, and let alone children. Um, so already we're dealing with a system that that is that that just shouldn't exist for, for prosecuting prosecuting children. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the the um, the the legitimacy of these courts, the the people who are prosecuting the children, the people who are judging the children, are all active members of the Israeli military. So the courts fail to meet independent state, uh, excuse me, international standards of independence and impartiality. Um, the conviction rate in these courts is um, about 95% for Palestinian children. And most of most children are actually um, encouraged by our attorneys and others to take plea bargains because that's the fastest way to get them out of the system. From the moment these children are arrested, they're subject to ill treatment, rights abuses, um, and, and violations of, of basic due process rights. So about three quarters of the children that we document and, and uh, are subject to physical violence upon arrest. That can be anything from being hit, slapped, punched, hit with the stock of a rifle um, and, and, and more, stomped on. Um, most of the children are have their hands restrained. Priscilla spoke last week about how most kids have their hands restrained with only one or two cords. So it's very tight and uncomfortable on the on the children's hands. The vast majority, 86%, are blindfolded. So they're disoriented. Most of these children, I think about two-thirds um, or about 
are arrested in night arrests on their homes. Um, so they're sitting in their beds, they're asleep at night, um, and all of a sudden they're awakened to a foreign army invading their their bedrooms. They're immediately made to made aware that they are not safe, that their family can't protect them, their home isn't safe. And it's a really disorienting experience um, that not only impacts the child, but also their, their families as well. Uh, children are, the children do not have access to attorneys during their interrogation. Um, really the only, the only right that they have is to speak to an attorney who will give them a legal consultation um, prior to their interrogation. We document all sorts of um, all sorts of ill treatment when children are are being detained. Everything from being held in solitary confinement, um, meant to to elicit confessions or information about the child's community, um, and so on and so forth. It's it's really even to me as somebody who has worked on this issue every day for three years, three or more years never ceases to shock me to see the type of cruelty that these children are subjected to and also to read about it over and over and over again and see that really it is systematic. It's totally intentional what's happening to these children. And so that's, we can move on to the next slide. Um, that's basically an overview of, of what some of these children are experiencing. Um, I mentioned earlier that most of the children that we represent take plea deals. That's because we as, a, as, 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 as an organization are guided by the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which stipulates that um, custodial detention should be a last resort and the best interests of the child should always be taken into, should always be prioritized. For us, the best interest of the child is to get that child back home to the safety relative safety and security that their families and communities can provide and the normalcy of, of everyday life um, as a child. And so um, the fastest way to do that is oftentimes to, to strike a plea bargain. For those of you that watched um, last week's webinar and have seen the, the film Obida, he's a, he's a prime example of why, why children take plea bargains. When Obida was first uh, arrested and charged with stone throwing, he actually fought those charges and he was acquitted because the, the um, Israeli soldier who was testifying against him was not, um, was not a reliable source and was not seen as, as, um, as being truthful. And so Obaida was, was ultimately acquitted and released, but he spent two, at the age of 14, two and a half months in detention because children are not granted um, bail uh, until the uh, while, their, while their legal proceedings are, are continuing. And so um, these are just some of the issues that we face as an organization. I think the reason that that we've really highlighted this as a, and Jennifer can speak more about the, the No Way to Treat a Child campaign and the origins of it, but we felt that really there was no working within this system to, to, um, to create change and protect Palestinian children. There have been slight modifications made um, to military law or the policies that are carried out, but they're really cosmetic in nature and don't impact children um, positively. They don't prevent the trauma from being inflicted on children and their families. And so um, we really felt that this was an issue that needed to be taken globally, um, that people needed to understand from the outside. Jennifer will tell you that five, six years ago, People didn't know anything about this issue. And now it's something that we hear spoken about on Capitol Hill. We see it um, addressed in, in UN body, by UN bodies. We see other human rights organizations, Israeli, Palestinian, international, taking on this issue to, to raise awareness about it. Um, because we know that, that it's really gonna be international pressure um, that will finally lead to, to Israeli authorities being accountable and also to the to the end of, of these terrible practices. 
So I think I will leave it there, um, but um, happy to answer any questions further on. Yeah, thank you so much for that overview, Shana. You gave a really great insight into not only what happens with child detention, but also why it's important for organizations and especially your organization to focus specifically on the rights of Palestinian children who, you know, if we talk about people who are kind of at the intersection of multiple areas of oppression, right? Children in a society experiencing occupation are some of the ones who experience the brunt of it and don't have as many areas where they can address issues or have people advocating for them. So thank you for that overview. Jennifer, I'd love to bring you in now and hear more about how American Friends Service Committee got involved with child detention and why it's important for everybody, but especially for faith communities to get involved and active around child detention. Thank you, Sarah. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, it's great to see, um, I echo Shana's feeling. It's nice to see some um, familiar names and faces uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, uh, I work with the American Friends Service Committee. That's a Quaker organization that was founded in 1917. Um, we do peace and social justice work um, as uh, part of our Quaker background and faith. Um, and our work with Palestine um, started in 1948, actually, um, when uh, Quakers were asked to come and help with the refugee crisis that, um, was happening in Gaza. And uh, we've, we've pretty much, as an organization, we've been engaged um, ever since. And um, I, as it said in my uh, bio, I, I've um, worked over three decades with the Quakers, with the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, and uh, uh, prior to that, I actually got the opportunity to live in Palestine. Uh, and um, I was a teacher there. And so uh, the love of children and um, kids and education is, uh, you know, something that I um, hold, hold dear to me. And uh, we wanted to put this slide up of, uh, of the children, because I know if you've been to Palestine, you've seen uh, children everywhere. Um, that's usually the, the first thing that um, a new visitor to um, to Palestine, we'll see is just how many children are running around and wanting to greet you when you come into their community. Uh, and um, so, so the fact that um, this campaign centers on children um, made a lot of sense to us, mainly because we, um, we feel that um, the love of children is a universal sentiment, um, including obviously in Palestine. Um, but also a way of really getting to the heart of the issue, which is the people and the future. Uh, and the, by focusing on children and what is happening to them, we, we really were excited to expose not just the human element um, of the conflict, but also the structural violence that um, uh, continues the oppression. Uh, so uh, the next slide, shows a few pictures from the early days of our campaign. Um, in 2015, uh, we organized our first congressional briefing. Um, that's the photo at the bottom there. Um, you know, we felt that um, when, when DCI Palestine, when Brad Parker uh, came uh, to um, meet with us in Chicago, we were a group of faith-based activists here to try to convince us to, to start a campaign and work on this issue, we felt that, that um, we were interested in doing something that would target our elected officials because for so many a year, so many years we've been, uh, as my bio said, organizing speaking tours and conferences and doing the educational work and, and wanted to start to translate that into other other audiences and, and see if we could mobilize the pressure um, that we felt was changing the, the discourse in this country about Palestinian rights and, and bring that to Congress. And, and really when we started, we weren't sure that we would find any champions of the issue uh, for, I see a few people uh, my age and older on this call. And as you know, it's been um, pretty challenging over the years to talk about Palestinian rights in Washington, DC. Um, but we felt 
that maybe the time was right. And certainly with this message um, focused on children and their rights and their families was, was an important one. And what we felt Im was important to do was to, um, as uh, you were saying um, about Talos's um, philosophy of, of centering those who are um, impacted and mar marginalized in our community, we wanted to bring the voices of Palestinian children to members of Congress. Um, and because of the, the great divide of our ocean and visa laws and other challenges, um, the, what we decided to do that first year was to make a film um, called Detaining Dreams that basically um, visualized that stages of detention, that, that slide, earlier slide that we showed you of children talking about what they experienced at all the different stages of, of um, detention of, from home arrest to experiences in prison and, and then their lives afterwards. So we brought that film and uh, a small group of activists, that's a picture of a few of us uh, there in front of the Supreme Court building in DC, um, started to walk the halls of Congress and to, to talk to offices about the issue. Um, we organized our, as our own briefing because we didn't feel that any of the committees in Congress would do a good job of bringing the right witnesses to speak. Uh, and we found champions. If we go to the next slide. Um, let's see. Oh, so this is this is just a description of of um, what our our no way to treat a child campaign is about, which is to to focus on uh, the treatment of children and and to talk about all the things that Shana just spoke about and bring that um that information to uh our communities and to our members of congress but the next slide um so uh what we um did early on was to create i would say important things one was um to know who the audience was that we wanted to organize to bring to members of congress um obviously um, human rights organizations and people who focus on human rights was a, a big part of who we were mobilizing to, to bring into the conversation, but also faith communities we felt was really key. Um, as, as somebody who works in the faith community as a Quaker, um, we had long tried to um, engage our community, but also others in, in finding ways to, to work together to lift up both the experiences of Palestinian Christians, because for many, many Americans didn't even know there were Palestinian Christians that exist, uh, but also um, the, the broader community, obviously. And um, there are several organizations and networks in Washington, DC and across the country that um, we appealed to support this campaign. And um, from the beginning, we've had great success at um, having um, different denominations have conversations within their own faith organizations, whether it's at their um, national in-person conventions when we used to have those, <laughs> uh, uh, passing resolutions and uh, engaging um, the communities and, and um, with information, sharing the videos, listening to testimonies. Um, so we, from the beginning, created a website and tools that we felt could, could enhance that kind of, um, that kind of advocacy. Um, so the next slide is, uh, yep, the, the first bill. Um, so the, 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 as, as we said, we started in 2015 and those first two years was just really a lot of hard work at identifying some allies in Congress, uh, getting some dear colleague letters written, uh, sent to the different, um, to this uh, Secretary of State and, um, and we switched over um, uh, diff to different presidents during that time. And in 2017, uh, Representative Betty McCollum um, finally felt that she was ready to introduce legislation. Um, just seeing her evolution from being, you know, interested in, in all the documentation and 
um, surprised and, and chagrined at the treatment of children um, and wanting to figure out a, a, a successful strategy of speaking with her colleagues on the issue finally resulted in a, in a bill. So on November 14th, 2017 was the first bill in US history on Palestinian rights was introduced um, in Congress. And um, it was a, a bill that finally got 30 um, congressional co-sponsors uh, and it was it really changed the game. Um, so since then, next slide, we've had now we are in um, uh, 2021 and we have a third bill in Congress, um, and that is HR 2590, um, which we'll we'll talk about a little bit longer, but it's um, a, a little bit later, but it's um, a the, a bill that focuses on Palestinian children and their families. And it continues to have a focus on child detention uh, and wanting to ensure that our US tax money doesn't su support the detention of children. But also um, this new bill expands to also talk about um, how children's families are impacted, particularly around house demolitions and expropriation of Palestinian land and resources and water and so forth. So um, this new bill that we can talk about a little bit more in detail later um, has really helped us to see how far we've come in just these five years from being uh, two organizations or a handful of organizations that supported those initial congressional briefings to over 160 organizations now um, supporting this legislation. Um, so this legislation just dropped this, uh, this past April uh, and 160 organizations are now um, co-sponsoring, including about a third of those uh, organizations are from, from faith communities, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian faith communities. So we feel really good about where we're headed, um, that this all this kind of work has helped to, to build the, the pressure and as Shana said earlier, change a conversation, actually create a conversation uh, that um, wasn't happening out in the public um, discourse too, or in the public view domain too much. Um, I think that, oh, maybe the next slide um, just, shows um, a few things on our website um, at 2590, um, the pa Palestinian Children and Families Act is, we ha do have a lot of resources that one of the things that we learned about doing grassroots organizing, um, I would say, and particularly with all ages and people from all different um, backgrounds, um, that having a really resource rich website is pretty key. Um, so from the beginning, we were very, um, you know, focused on getting good resources on our website of, of having things, uh, you've noticed a color scheme that goes with it. So you know that that's, that's our, our campaign. Um, even the phrase, no way to treat a child and, um, and that kind of thing is, has been really important. So um, the, I think if you could skip maybe two slides ahead, um, one of the things that we've done to keep people engaged even during the pandemic, I mean, we, we did do a lot of in-person lobbying um, prior to the pandemic, and we've encouraged people to continue to have meetings with your members of Congress online, uh, and people are doing that. Um, and at the same time, we have been continuing to have monthly webinars where we give updates about um, what's happening on the ground with Palestinian children, uh, conditions that uh, are discussed in the bill so that people would have fresh stories or new ways um, to have conversations with new people about the issue. And next slide, um, we also continue to use uh, a lot of our social media tools to share uh, updates and, and to encourage people to engage with us. So 
it's really been um, a growing network of, of activists. Our last webinar this past month um, focused on a campaign started by a handful of people in Ireland. Uh, and it was really, um, really rewarding and, and exciting to see how um, this issue um, has really caught on um, with so many communities. That, and again, I really think that part of the beauty of the campaign is that it kind of reaches all parts of, of one's being. It, you know, it, it reaches your heart because of your love for children. It, it, it involves your brain because you actually do have to learn about laws and what is military detention and what's some of the history. And, and so it really engages you that way. But we also have to use our hands and feet and get involved. And um, even if it's virtually, <laughs> that's what uh, we're always trying to think of new ways that we can create resources that um, more people can engage with us either through sharing films, telling stories, engaging the media, um, and, and attending briefings and, and moving members of Congress to, to um, support this kind of work. So I think- Thank you so was, much for that yeah, overview, I think, Jennifer. I know we'll, we'll keep unpacking I think we're done minute. with the uh, slides. I think you can take those. Thanks. Ones. Yeah. So I wanna, before I ask you to give us more specific ways we can get involved with the No Way to Treat a Child campaign, I do wanna come back to the HR 2590, the bill, in part because I want us to return back to this idea of owning our agency and responsibility. And for me, the first time I heard about this bill was also the first time I'd heard about child detention. And I think that, you know, this is not a conversation about whether or not the US should fund Israel militarily, at Telos, our uh, end goal is mutual flourishing, freedom, dignity, and security for Israelis and Palestinians. That's kind of the framework we approach all of this through. But to me, child detention was a really clear example where there was no freedom, dignity, or security for Palestinians at all, kind of caught up in a military apparatus that the US helps fund. And so for me, what was so powerful about this bill is that it says, you know, we're leaving all of the other conversation on the table. We're not trying to have that. We're focusing in on one really clear example of injustice that we don't want to support. And I think that really shows what owning your agency and responsibility looks like. We have a responsibility for how our shared resources, our tax dollars, our military funding is used. And we have the agency to advocate, to join the No Way to Treat a Child campaign, and to say we don't want our resources used in a way that really disenfranchises and harms Palestinian children in society. Um, so Shana or Jennifer, could either of you talk a little bit more about this bill and why it's one that is so important and how we can maybe communicate about it to our communities who maybe are skeptical about any bill that critiques how we militarily support Israel? Sure. Jennifer, you want me to take this one? All right. So as Jennifer mentioned, this is the third bill that's been introduced in, in Congress um, related to, to military detention. And this one actually goes, has actually broadened to be, um, to look at other rights violations that Palestinians and Palestinian communities are experiencing. So the bill really seeks to do two things and that's accountability and transparency. And so the first thing that the bill does is that it seeks to limit assistance and, and make sure that US tax dollars are not used for a number of prohibited activities, what activities that would be prohibited. And that the first is, is of course the military detention of Palestinian treatment and ill treatment of Palestinian children in, and in violation of international humanitarian law. The second thing that the bill seeks to do is prevent US tax dollars from being used for the seizure, appropriation, or destruction of Palestinian property or the forcible transfer of Palestinian civilians. And the third thing that it seeks to do is to prevent US tax dollars from being used um, for any further unilateral annexation of the occupied West Bank. So, and all of those activities are prohibit, they're already prohibit prohibitions under international law, international humanitarian law, international human rights law. And so really it's seeking to ensure that our US tax dollars aren't complicit in violations of international law, which 
I think most Americans would agree that they don't want their tax dollars being used to violate people's rights. Um, the second thing that the bill does is that it it seeks to increase transparency on how our fund on how our tax dollars are being used, and so it requires the sec it would require the Secretary of State. Uh, Secretary Blinken to certify and report that our funds are not being used um, in furtherance of those prohibited activities. And if they are being used, how exactly are they being used? The bill also um, re would require the Secretary of State to include detailed information about those prohibited activities in annual reports on human rights uh, violations. So each every state that receives US funding, um, there's a report on, on their compliance with human rights that's published every year. Actually, there have been multiple years where child milit children in military detention have been mentioned in those reports. So this really seeks to ensure that that the US is continuing to keep a spotlight on these issues and focus on these issues and monitor them. And then the third thing that the bill seeks to do is it would require, um, so each year about $3.8 billion in aid goes to, to or in funding, in tax funding goes to um, the Israeli government. And almost $800 million of that is allocated for Israel. Most of that money comes back into the US um, weapons industry. But about $800 million of that uh, goes goes to Israel where they can spend it within their own um, military industries. And we really don't track how that how that money is being spent. And so this bill really would require that we keep track of how that money is being spent and what it's being used for. So again, it's all meant to ensure that US tax dollars aren't being used to, to further human rights violations in the occupied Palestinian territory. I think the a few things about this bill that are important to keep in mind is that, first of all, this bill is really seen as a vehicle, a vehicle for engaging with elected officials, a vehicle for engaging with your communities, whether they're faith based or um, part of the peace movement, that it's really meant to be a vehicle to educate people about what's going on on the ground. We've told you these the, these statistics. Last week, we heard the story of Obida um, and all that he went through. And so really, this bill is the is the means for people to, to really continue to talk about it and to refocus the conversation to one that centers human rights and, and specifically Palestinian human rights, which are oftentimes neglected in the conversation around um, Palestine, Israel. Uh, it used to be that uh, when you would go up to Capitol Hill and knock on a congressperson's door and say, hey, I'm concerned about Palestine, basically the answer you would get is, well, I support a two-state solution. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And the, the political solution that happens is, is is important, of course, but what we're really seeking to do is to ensure that the centering of human rights is part of whatever um, so solution comes out of this, and that, and to ensure that, and to refocus the conversation from one that's focused on a political solution to one that ensures that people's rights are are respected. And so, this bill really gives people the opportunity to go to their member of Congress and refocus the conversation. On, on protecting people's human rights. Jennifer mentioned the first bill, 2407, um, or excuse me, 4391, was the, was the first ever bill focused on Palestinian human rights. That was in 2017. We aren't even, it was introduced in November of 2017. So four years ago, there had never been a bill focusing on human rights, centering Palestinians' human rights. And so th that's what this campaign is about. It's about finding ways to reach out to our communities and center a rights-based approach, as opposed to one that focuses purely on, on the political. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. That's really helpful, Shana. Thanks for explaining some of the nitty gritty about what the bill is trying to do and, and what's in it.
Jennifer, there are, as you mentioned, there are so many really great resources on the No Way to Treat a Child campaign website, and you can spend so much time digging through those. I encourage you all to go look at those. They're really fantastic. But in a, in a maybe a, a nutshell or a, a slightly larger nutshell, can you give us a run through of a couple of different ways people can get involved in the campaign, especially if something like contacting their congressperson is something that they haven't done before or feels like is a really big intimidating step? Yes, well, always remember that your member of Congress is there to serve you as a constituent. So <laughs> I would say, don't be intimidated. You know, you're you're the boss, uh, not them. Uh, so, uh, but but sure, it's if you've never engaged with a member of Congress before, it can be intimidating. And um, I think sometimes people find. Um, courage when they um, can unite with other people who share their views. Um, and some of us are lucky to live in communities where there are a lot of organizations. Um, one of those 150, 160 organizations who have supported this bill. Um, but, um, but sometimes we don't. And I, I found that sometimes people will start with something simple like inviting a couple of friends over to uh, watch a video together, or if you can't see each other in person to uh, watch something online and then have a conversation about it, about, and, and talk about like what, what, in, what in from Detaining Dreams or Obeda did you find that moved you? Um, what are some of the things that made you feel that, um, that there was an injustice there and, and what can you do about it and, and strategize together with your friends. I mean, that that is how uh, we sat around the kitchen to my kitchen table and came up with No Way to Treat a Child campaign was, was just that. It was, you know, uh, um, eight or nine people who um, just felt like we we needed to do to take some sort of collective action. Uh, so, that, so that's, you know, um, having... Uh, Having a conversation at your um, at your you know at, uh, on Sunday uh, with your adult education group, or even um, don't be shy. Talk to uh, young people, you know, high school people, uh, aged um, and younger people really can relate to this situation, and they ask very good questions about like, well, wait a minute, well, how can they get justice, and if it's ninety five percent. Uh, conviction rate, is that really a, a, how courts should operate? Like they ask very good, uh, important questions. So, um, you know, I, I would encourage you all to think about, um, to think about that. And there are, um, we give a lot of opportunities for how to engage your member of Congress. It's nice that we have an ask to sign on to a bill. Um, some people will say yes, but there isn't any Republicans who have signed on yet, or my representative has said no to this bill. So what what do I do? It, um, it just hearing no, I'm not going to sign isn't the end of the. It shouldn't stop you. Um, we really encourage people to build up a relationship with your member of Congress, um, whether it's through writing letters or visiting, um, finding out where they're going to be. Um, that was easier before COVID, but um, even since then, uh, you know, candidates show up to fundraise in your community or they'll host uh, town hall meetings and things like that. And so we've helped people prepare questions for, the, for engaging um, with the public. Um, and yeah, we, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, individual uh, support work, uh, <laughs> Shana, myself and Brad and Miranda, um, in helping people figure out what's the best way to, to, um, to bring up the issue, if it's a new issue to a member of Congress or if they're already on board. It's also like if they've already signed, then as we encouraged uh, our friends in Delaware who, a um, member of Congress signed on to the bill this June after several years of trying to um, find support from that member of Congress. Um, and we said, well, did you send a thank you gift? Like, did you bring a, a plaque to put up on their 
uh, in their office to, to say, thank you for supporting the rights of Palestinian children. And they're like, ah, oh, good idea. And they've done that uh, just in the last few months. So there's constantly things that we can do. When, when we were out in public, we used to uh, uh, wear buttons uh, that had uh, stop Palestinian detention on them just to wear to start conversations with, with people in the grocery store or Target or whatever. Um, that's a little bit more difficult now um, with people social distancing and maybe not wanting to talk <laughs> as much as before. But um, but those are some of the strategies that, that people have used um, to use the resources, share them, talk to friends and family, um, have the conversation, write to your members of uh, write to your local press, write to your members of Congress and just keep at it. Becca asked what you thought it would take to get this passed in the Senate. And that for me brings up another really important question of how we measure success in this. And Jennifer, I know you talked about how the campaign has grown since you started and sometimes stepping into a campaign, we don't see the way it's grown. We only see how much work is left to be done ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So can either or both of you address, you know, both Becca's question around what it would take to get this passed, but then also how you see success and progress. Also keeping in mind what Shana said about different things have changed along the way that haven't really helped the underlying systemic issues. Yeah. So first of all, it would take a lot to get this bill to become law. Um, first of all, we'd need to have a majority of the 435 members of the House supporting it. And right now we're at 31. Um, we also would need a companion bill introduced in the Senate that would also have to pass with at least um, with at least a majority, I think maybe even two thirds. Um, and so, or no, I guess majority. And so um, that is unlikely to happen. And, and I think it's important for us to be thinking about the long term in terms of this is the third bill that's introduced. Um, this is the third bill that's been introduced, but it also is definitely not gonna be the last bill that's introduced and that we are seeing that the movement is growing. We are seeing an increase in um, supporters in Congress. We've now surpassed the number of supporters that we had on the first bill, 4391. Um, and so I think we have to kind of take stock and say, this is working. We're see And we're seeing the conversation shift. We're seeing it, I think we saw it, um, the conversation around Palestinian rights and, and impact on children shifted again in this past May. We saw it um, when there was the Israeli military assault on Gaza. Um, and so we're seeing the progress happen far too slowly, but we're seeing that it's happening. Whereas I think for a long time, it felt like there was nothing we could do or things were actually getting worse. That isn't to say that things aren't terrible for Palestinians on the ground. And I think ending this yesterday still wouldn't be soon enough for Palestinians. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, but I think I saw a question about what the goal of this is. And yes, the goal is to, to use the, these bills as vehicles to shift the conversation, to shift the discourse in hopes that eventually, hopefully sooner rather than later, we will have legislation introduced that gets passed. Um, and that is implemented and 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 does protect Palestinian Palestinian human rights. Um, and and of course, an end to the occupation and and systemic oppression of Palestinians. So um, I think it's hard to it's hard to know um, how long that will take. But I think I just shared in the chat an example of somebody asking Elizabeth Warren this past weekend to introduce a Senate companion bill. And so we need to continue as, as frustrating as it feels. And, and we, we have people who you know keep going back to their members of Congress and keep getting no's, but eventually they'll either get a yes, like we saw in Delaware, or they'll start realizing, okay, we need to mobilize to find a new person in Congress who, who, can, who can represent our views um, on this issue. And so I think we're seeing that as a as a 
that it's it's working to to continue to move move people on the issue. Jennifer, can you give us a little more context for the way this has worked to move people on the issue and, and share a little bit more about how the American Friends Service Committee and the No Way to Treat a Child campaign have grown and you know, maybe more importantly, where you find hope in that growth, even if what Shana is describing feels like it's a long way off. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I'm, I guess I have the uh, privilege of <laughs> many years of doing this work uh, to feel hopeful because, um, because I see more and more communities um, you know, basically waking up to the fact that if there is going to be peace between Israelis and Palestinians and uh, that there needs to be the presence of justice and that the American role in bringing about a, a better future for Palestinians and Israelis is a critical one. Uh, I think um, many Americans in the past didn't see how our country was really involved. Um, people would say to me, you know, so what do you do for a job? And I would <laughs> say I work for the American Friends Service Committee and I focus on uh, the Middle East or, or Israel and Palestine. And they'll say, oh, wow, well, that, that's an intractable situation and things will never, you know, they hated each other forever and that kind of thing. And it's like, okay. So where do I start unpacking all the all those misconceptions? Um, but uh, you know, so beyond um, trying to say, actually, you know, there's a reason why there there is continuing violence, and that it actually is something that can be changed. Uh, and to say that we're not we who are not um, Palestinian or Israeli have um, have a role to play because um, through our tax money every year um, we give billions of dollars to sustain um, these the the system that is uh, abusing Palestinian rights that it's not getting us any clear any closer to seeing freedom and equality and justice for Israelis and Palestinians to be able to live and thrive with dignity. Um, by continuing to, to um, support uh, military solutions and to rely on sending so much military aid, um, especially without any strings attached. Uh, we just this uh, week launched a, a, a short video I'll put in the chat, kind of explaining how US uh, military assistance to Israel differs than to any other country, um, that they really do get kind of a special treatment when it comes to how they get the money and, and in what ways they get it. Um, and that exposing that and having more and more Americans understand that that is, um, that is what's happening um, is super important. Uh, and I think, um, you know, the polling data is starting to, to shift in our direction. Um, more, uh, a majority of people polled um, in recent polls from who identify as Democrats or, or um, you know, supporting human rights will sh uh, show many more people in the Jewish community even who um, think that settlements are an obstacle to peace that think that there should be pressure on Israel to respect human rights and that kind of thing. So um, I think that it is shifting. Um, there are more signs in our in our popular culture as well um, that people are wanting to hear Palestinian perspectives. Uh, they're seeing films like The Present, that uh, <laughs> documentary that was uh, just up this year for an Academy Award and things like that. But we have a long way to go. Um, you know, the fact that uh, U.S. bombs can rain on Gaza for um, two weeks uh, and not see policy change, not see people clamoring for an immediate ceasefire or asking that our U.S. weapons not be used. Um, we still have a ways to go at, at, um, at changing policy, that's for sure. But but I am uh, 
an optimist, at least in um, thinking that um, there are more and more opportunities for people to both make connections to what is happening in our own country and waking up to some of the injustices um, we see in our communities here uh, and what, what's happening um, with Palestinians. Well, we're almost at the end of our time together. So I wanna ask Shana or Jennifer if there's any last kind of concluding thought that you wanna share before we wrap up. I guess I just would throw in a final pitch for people to sign up on, on the No Way website to join our mailing list and, and to join our webinars, which are one of my favorite parts of my job because it's the time that we get to connect with activists. It's when we get to take what we're hearing from activists on the ground in terms of, well, I'm getting this feedback from my members of Congress. And we you know, can address that directly and talk about um, strategies to continue pushing the discourse along. It's when we get to highlight, like Jennifer mentioned, um, activism, that grassroots activism that we think is a model for other communities um, and, and also give people a chance to hear about what's going on on the ground. We've also expanded to talk about issues beyond just child detention. So for people who are interested more generally in, in Palestinian children and the issues impacting them, it's also a great um, time once a month to kind of get a little snippet of what um, DCIP, Defense for Children International Palestine, is focusing on. One thing I forgot to mention at the beginning of the, the conversation is that since our founding 30 years ago as a legal aid organization, we've expanded tremendously in terms of the types of violations that we document. And so we have, and we have a team of over 40 people on the ground in Palestine who um, are collecting information about all sorts of human rights violations beyond just military detention. So it's really a chance to get um, to get uh, an inside look at what's happening on the ground and to think about um, and learn about strategies on, on what we can do um, to, to try and make things better or hold perpetrators uh, accountable. I guess I would also just add, you know, once um, once the conditions are um, changed and we're able to travel again, if you haven't um, visited uh, Israel and Palestine, I would encourage you to to do so and to uh, get the opportunity really to experience um, both the wonderful aspects of Palestinian hospitality and um, commitment to land and people, um, but also the, the kind of challenging realities of what military occupation is like um, and to, to walk through checkpoints and to see the highly militarized um, uh, situation that inf impacts uh, all the people living there. Well, thank you so much for your insights and your wisdom, Jennifer and Shannon, for spending the past hour with us, educating us more on child detention, and also helping us figure out how we can get active. To everybody else on the call who's had the pleasure of listening to them with me, I invite you to join me in thinking about how we can own our agency and responsibility around this issue, how we can follow up with the No Way to Treat a Child campaign and find a way, you know, either big or small to get active on this and to really try and combat child detention. Um, it's a really important issue to be aware of and take seriously if we're working for mutual flourishing and is one that I hope you all have learned a lot more about and are eager to bring back to your communities. Um, if you're interested in joining us for future events, we don't have any scheduled currently, but you can sign up for our newsletter and we'll let you know when we've got more webinars with fantastic folks like Shana and Jennifer. And in the meantime, I hope that you all get involved and I'm eager to hear what you all do with the No Way to Treat a Child campaign. So thanks again, Jennifer and Shana, for spending this past hour with us. We really appreciate all of the work you do around this issue. Thank you, Sarah. And thank, thank you, you all for joining us. Yeah, thank you.